We earnestly seek China's cooperation on North Korea. We do not seek such cooperation at the expense of our other vital interests. We must not and will not bargain over our alliances or over fundamental principles of the rules-based order. As its behavior toward South Korea indicates over the last several years, China has acted less and less like a responsible stakeholder of the rules-based order in the region and more like a bully. It has economically coerced its neighbors, increased its provocations in the East China Sea, and militarized the South China Sea. Meanwhile, with a rebalanced policy, too heavy, heavy on rhetoric and too light on action, years of senseless defense cuts, and now the disastrous decision to withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, U.S. policy has failed to adapt to the scale and velocity of China's challenge to the rules-based order. And that failure has caused into question the credibility of America's security commitments in the region. This committee has grown increasingly concerned about the erosion of America's conventional military overmatch as states like China and North Korea develop advanced capabilities to counter our ability to project military power. While America's military remains the most powerful on Earth, we must adapt to the new realities we face. We must think differently about forward basing and force posture, logistics and mobilization, and take steps to reshape the capabilities of our joint force for the renewed reality of great power competition. Specifically on the issue of munitions, this committee has heard testimony each year about the qualitative and quantitative shortfalls we have in our munitions, but we've seen little action from the services to finally turn the corner and address this issue with serious with the seriousness it requires. Admiral Harris, I'm interested in your views on munitions requirements and what it will take to meet them. The new administration has an important opportunity to chart a different and better course. At our hearing earlier this week, our panel of experts, witnesses, agreed there was a strong merit for a, quote, Asia-Pacific stability initiative. This initiative could enhance U.S. military power through targeted fun funding to realign our force posture in the region, improve operationally relevant infrastructure, fund additional exercises, pre-position equipment, and build capacity with our allies and partners. Admiral Harris, I'm eager to hear your thoughts on this kind of an initiative. And Admiral, I think there's some sim symbolism in your appearance today and the information that the Chinese are now building their own aircraft carrier. I'm sure that uh, as an old naval aviator that uh, that has some interest for you. Senator Reid. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you, Admiral Harris, for being here today. And we understand how difficult this time must be for you and for General Brooks and all the men and women that you lead, and we want you to express our great appreciation for their efforts. Uh, it's clear to me, especially after the thoughtful discussion we had on Tuesday with our outside panel, that there is no set of options that lead to a quick and certain strategy on North Korea. While I believe that we should pursue and exhaust every diplomatic option to bring the North Korean regime to the negotiating table, those options are somewhat limited. China provides the lifeline for North Korea and China for its own national security interest seems unwilling to exert the type of pressure that is needed to convince the regime that denuclearization is the only path forward. Even if China were willing to exert that type of pressure, it seems that Kim Jong-un is so determined to pursue his nuclear program that he is willing to risk impoverishing and starving his own population to achieve his dream of becoming a nuclear-capable state. There are military options, but they are risky. A comprehensive strike on nuclear facilities may precipitate a catastrophic retaliation against the civilian population of Seoul or against our bases and service members in South Korea or Japan. A surgical strike, while less risky, may not deter the North Korean regime and runs the risk of emboldening Kim Jong-un. Complicating factors, of course, are the stockpile of chemical and biological weapons at his disposal and road mobile missile launches spread across the countryside. North Korea's nuclear missile program is an immediate and grave national security threat. Admiral Harris, I ask that you tell us how you are preparing for every contingency on the peninsula. 
While North Korea poses an immediate national security threat, we must not lose sight of the potential long-term threat that China poses to the rules-based order in the Asia-Pacific region. Whether it be economic coercion of its smaller, more vulnerable neighbors or undermining the freedom of navigation that we all depend upon, China has not demonstrated a willingness to rise as a responsible global leader. Therefore, I believe it is critical that we empower and engage countries in Southeast Asia and South Asia to protect their own waterways and provide them with economic alternatives to maintain regional stability, preserve U.S. standing in Asia, and allow the economic growth and stability that has characterized the region for the last 50 years to continue. Again, thank you, Admiral, for your service, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral. Thank you, uh, Chairman McCain and Senator Reid and distinguished members. Uh, it is an honor for me to appear before this committee. There are many things to talk about since my last testimony 14 months ago. Uh, I regret that I'm not here with my testimony battle buddy, uh, General Vince Brooks, but I think you'll all agree that he's where he's needed most right now on the Korean Peninsula. Mr. Chairman, I request that my written posture statement be submitted for the record. As a PACOM commander, I have the extraordinary privilege of leading about 375,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and DOD civilians serving our nation uh, over half the globe. These dedicated patriots are doing an amazing job, and thanks to them, America remains the security partner of choice in the region. That's important because I believe that America's future and economic prosperity are inextricably linked to the Indo-Asia Pacific a region that's poised at the strategic nexus where opportunity meets the four considerable challenges of North Korea, China, Russia, and ISIS. It's clear to me that ISIS is a threat that must be destroyed now, but as we eliminate ISIS in the Middle East and North Africa, some of the surviving fighters will likely repatriate to their home countries in the Indo-Asia Pacific. So we must continue to work with like-minded nations to eradicate ISIS before it grows in the PACOM area of responsibility. Then there's North Korea, which remains the most immediate threat uh, to the security of the United States and our allies in Japan and Korea. North Korea has vigorously pursued a strategic strike capability with nuclear tests and ballistic missile launches, which it claims are intended to target the United States, South Korea, Japan, and just earlier this week, Australia. Make no mistake. Kim Jong-un is making progress on his quest for nuclear weapons and a means to deliver them intercontinentally. All nations need to take this threat seriously because North Korea's missiles point in all directions. North Korea's capabilities are not yet an existential threat to America, but if left unchecked, it will eventually match the capability uh, to hostile rhetoric. I know that there's some debate about North Korea's intent and the miniaturization advancements made by Pyongyang, and I won't add to that speculation. Regardless, my job is to provide military options to the President. And because PACOM must be ready to fight tonight, I must assume that Kim Jong-un's nuclear claims are true. I know his aspirations certainly are. That's why General Brooks and I are doing everything possible to defend the American homeland and our allies in the Republic of Korea and Japan. That's why the ROC U.S. Alliance decided last July to deploy THAAD, the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, which will be operational in the coming days uh, and able to better defend South Korea against the growing North Korean threat. That's why the USS Carl Vinson Carrier Strike Group is back on patrol in Northeast Asia. That's why we must continue to debut America's newest and best military platforms in the Indo-Asia Pacific. That's why we want to continue to emphasize trilateral cooperation between the United States, South Korea, and Japan, a partnership with a purpose, if there ever was one. And that's why we continue to call on China to exert its considerable influence to stop Pyongyang's unprecedented weapons testing. While recent actions by Beijing are encouraging, the fact remains that China is as responsible for where North Korea is as North Korea itself. In confronting the reckless North Korean regime, it's critical that we're guided by a strong sense of resolve, both privately and publicly, both diplomatically and militarily. As President Trump and Secretary Mattis have made clear, all options are on the table. We want to bring Kim Jong-un to his senses and not to his knees. We're also challenged in the Indo-Asia Pacific by an aggressive China and a revanchist Russia. 
China continues a methodical strategy to control the South China Sea. I testified last year that China was militarizing this critical international waterway and the airspace above it by building air and naval bases on seven Chinese man-made islands in the disputed Spratlys. Despite subsequent Chinese assurances at the highest levels that they would not militarize these bases today, they have these facilities that support long-range weapons emplacements, fighter aircraft hangars, radar towers, and barracks for their troops. China's militarization of the South China Sea is real. I'm also not taking my eyes off of Russia, which just last week flew bomber missions near Alaska uh, on successive days for the first time since 2014. Russia continues to modernize its military and exercises its considerable conventional and nuclear forces in the Pacific. So despite the region's four significant challenges, since my last report to you, we've strengthened America's network of alliances and partnerships. Working with like-minded partners on shared security threats like North Korea and ISIS is a key component of our regional strategy. Our five bilateral defense treaty alliances, Australia, Japan, the Republic of Korea, the Philippines, and Thailand anchor our joint force efforts in the Indo-Asia Pacific. We've also advanced important partnerships with India and Indonesia, Malaysia, New Zealand, Singapore, and Sri Lanka, Vietnam, and others, all with a view toward reinforcing the rules-based security order that has helped underwrite peace and stability and prosperity throughout the region for decades. But there's more work to do. We must be ready to confront all challenges from a position of strength and with credible combat power. So I ask this committee to support continued investment to improve military capabilities. I need weapon systems of increased lethality, precision, speed, and range that are networked and cost effective. And restricting ourselves with funding uncertainties reduces warfighting readiness, so I urge Congress to repeal sequestration and to approve the proposed Defense Department budget. Finally, I'd like to thank Chairman McCain and this committee for proposing and supporting the Asia-Pacific Stability Initiative. This effort will reassure our regional partners and send a strong signal to potential adversaries of our persistent commitment to the region. As always, I thank the Congress for your enduring support to the men and women of PACOM and to our families who care for us. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Sir. Thank you, Admiral, and thank you for the outstanding job and your outstanding leadership that you are exhibiting in these very difficult and uh, challenging times. Uh, Admiral, would, would you say that it's an accurate statement to say that the crisis on the Korean Peninsula now is reminiscent. It reminds one of a gradual Cuban Missile Crisis. Sir, I, I'll, I'll just say that I think the crisis on the Korean Peninsula is the is real. It's the worst I've seen. Uh, I'm not a student of the Cuban Missile Crisis, but what I know of it, it seems that we are uh, faced uh, with a threat and a leader who is intent uh, on achieving his goal uh, and uh, of, uh, of uh, 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 nuclear capability uh, against the United States. And that leader does not always behave in a rational fashion. Is that correct from you? That's, cor that's correct, sir. I, I believe that, uh, you know, uh, to ascribe terms like rational or irrational to, 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 to Kim Jong-un is probably not helpful because he is what he is, and we have to deal with the Kim Jong-un that is. Uh, and I believe that he, he does have some kind of uh, calculus uh, that ends up in decisions. So he takes information and makes a decision. Uh, and those decisions are often brutal, uh, and the decisions uh, are there to keep uh, him and his family uh, in power in North Korea. And it's clear that his goal is a nuclear weapon and the means to deliver it to the United States of America. Is there any doubt in your mind? There is, there is no doubt in my mind, Chairman. And there is some question, given the difficulty of getting real reliable intelligence, as to how close he is to reaching that goal? Uh, there, there is, there is some uh, um, uh, doubt or questions within the intelligence com uh, community 
whether he has that capability today or whether he will soon have that capability. Uh, but I have to uh, assume that he has it, uh, as do my fellow combatant commanders, Lori Robinson and uh, John Hyten. And we have to assume that the capability uh, is real. We know his intentions are, uh, and he's moving toward them. He's also- So it's not a matter of whether, it's a matter of when. It, it is clearly a matter of when. Uh, as I said yesterday, um, uh, KJU is not a leader who's afraid to fail in public. And so, you know, I, I talked about Thomas Edison. He tried a thousand times before he got the light bulb to work. Uh, KJU is going to continue to try what until does, he gets his ICBMs to work. What does that do for us it, it, and it, South Korea? I, I, I think the point that KJU's rhetoric, and he's threatened the United States and cities by name, and just this week he threatened Australia by name, uh, I think his rhetoric, uh, if you were to project it on a graph, uh, it's going in one direction. And then his capability is approaching the line of his uh, capability is approaching the line <laughs> of his rhetoric. And where those, those lines cross, uh, I believe we are then at an inflection point uh, and we wake up to a new world. What does THAAD do for us? THAAD uh, enables us uh, and uh, the, our South Korean allies to defend uh, South Korea or a big portion of South Korea against the threat from North Korea. Uh, it is aimed at North Korea, uh, the, the systems, uh, and it, it poses no threat but isn't, to China. Isn't it incredibly difficult to counter the 4,000 artillery pieces that the North Koreans have on the DMZ, which could attack a city of 26 million people? Uh, it, it is, sir, and that is not designed to counter uh, those kinds of uh, uh, basic weapons. And what is designed to do that? Anything? Uh, uh, we, we do not have uh, those kinds of weapons uh, that can counter those uh, rockets once they're launched. And they can launch, they have the capability of a launch of those rockets. At, at this very moment. They have that capability, Senator. What do you make of China's reaction to our emplacement of that, a purely defensive system? Does that give you an idea of China's real intentions about North Korea? Uh, I've said before, uh, Chairman, that I believe it's preposterous that China would criticize South Korea or the United States for emplacing a purely defensive missile system against the North Korean threat uh, when that North Korean threat uh, owes its uh, survival, if you will, uh, to China. And, and I believe that China, rather than criticize the United States or South Korea for defending ourselves, should rather put that energy toward convincing uh, Kim Jong-un uh, to uh, stop his uh, nuclear ambitions. So we should be a bit skeptical about our ability to persuade the Chinese to break Kim Jong-un's quest for nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them. Uh, to avoid such confusion in the future, it was quite detrimental, not only here, but as you know, in South Korea particularly, where there was a great deal of concern, and in some, some quarters they felt that they had been uh, misled indeed. So I would urge you to um, ensure that uh, such a miscoordination or miscommunication is, does not happen in the future. Yes, sir. Uh, I, again, uh, as I said yesterday, uh, I'm accountable and responsible and for the uh, uh, communications that came out of that, that evolution. Uh, I'm sorry that it happened. Uh, and uh, uh, all I can say is that I will do better uh, in the future. Yes, sir. Uh, so Let me... Uh, raise an issue that uh, is linked to our diplomacy. We are asking uh, China to take a much more assertive role in uh, urging North Koreans to cease and desist. Um, but uh, your view in terms of what concessions we should make, if any, to the Chinese to get them to cooperate, as both the chairman and I pointed out and you pointed out, they, have, uh, they are opposing significant uh, challenges to the, the rule of, of law in the Pacific, and we can't ignore that. So your comments on this issue? Sir, uh, uh, Senator, I, I believe that 
that uh, great powers uh, can walk and chew gum at the same time. And by that, I mean that uh, I think we can compliment and be grateful uh, to, to, for China's efforts in North Korea, uh, even as we criticize them, rightfully so, and hold them accountable uh, for actions that run counter to, to international rules and norms elsewhere, in, in this case, the South China Sea. I think we can do both, and we should do both. And I think China, uh, as a great power, can handle that criticism uh, on the one hand uh, while they're dealing uh, with this important, critical uh, international security issue on the other. Uh, thank you. Uh, obviously, we're trying to, to uh, approach the North Korean issue with a comprehensive uh, strategy, diplomacy, you know, military action, military preparedness, certainly. Uh, one aspect is information warfare. Uh, my sense, and I'm not the expert you are, but uh, Kim Jong-un is paranoid about his own people and, and what information they're getting. And do you think we're making a, a sufficient effort to um, get information into North Korea through various means uh, so that we can begin to uh, bypass the dear leader and go to the people, and that could create uh, pressures on him to forestall his nuclear ambitions? I believe we're making an effort. I'm, I'm not uh, witting of the totality of that effort, uh, but I do believe that uh, uh, the people in North Korea revere Kim Jong-un. And, and, I, and I believe that the idea that somehow we could, uh, or that somehow that they could rise up against Kim Jong-un if the, situations, the situation in North Korea became so dire, uh, I think that might be a hollow hope. Uh, I believe that they, they consider him a god king, uh, and uh, they uh, truly revere him as their leader. Uh, and that, that's, that's just based on what I've read in the, in the press and, and reports of reporters who see uh, the, the North Korean people start to cry and all of this uh, get emotional when he comes out on stage, and they, and they seem to be real tears. So uh, I think that, uh, that he has a hold on his people, that they're not going to rise up from, from beneath and topple him. I, you know, again, I think your perspective is, uh, perception rather is, is, is uh, much closer to the situation on the ground. But anything we can do to either raise questions, I don't think they'll prompt an uprising immediately, not only questions among the population, but questions among the dear leader that uh, Kim Jong Un, that his people are being sort of influenced, or there might be elements within the country that are uh, thinking and embracing other ideas, could be uh, uh, some leverage. Uh, and, and I think we have to pursue aggressively these information operations. My sense and, is when. And I must agree with you there. So. Uh, just in one other I issue, and in. Uh, you know, we have been, uh, China has refused arbitration with the, with the, to acknowledge the decision of the arbitration clause under the law of the sea with the Philippines, et cetera. We do have a successful example of Timor, Leste, and Australia of working together with respect. And um, that might be a model, to, maybe just rhetorically, that we could use uh, with the Chinese and see if we could move them towards a more cooperative aspect with the Philippines. I, Sir, just... I, I agree with you there. Thank there, you. There are, there are several good examples uh, in the, just in the Indo-Asia Pacific where arbitration has worked. Mm -hmm. uh, both parties have given a little and gotten a lot, uh, and the overall uh, picture in the, in the region has been one of increased stability uh, rather than uh, decreased stability. Thank you very much, Admiral. Yeah. Admiral, I think these, um, what's happened in the last few days has served as a wake-up call to the American people. Of course, we had our, our hearing on, um, on Tuesday with some four pretty smart people that came to the same conclusion. Uh, we have you today, and of course, we have uh, the, uh, what happened yesterday at the White House as well as uh, other uh, places in, in, the, in the House. Uh, but we actually talked about this, and it's been obvious to those of us at, at this table that over a period of time, North Korea has, going all the way arguably back to the Scud B uh, times of the middle 70s, uh, 
progressing up to the no-dong and the typo dong one and typo dong two, and then ultimately coming up to the statement that he makes that declares that uh, North Korea, this is Kim Jong-un, declares that it's in its final, quote, final stages in preparations to test an intercontinental ballistic missile. So I think people now realize that it's, uh, it, it is that imminent threat, and, and they, they really haven't. I know that you deal with in military circles and you're dealing with people who know what threat is, but those of us around this table are dealing with the general public, many of whom do not understand that. So we had um, the hearing on Tuesday. Uh, they agreed that North Korea currently represents the single most imminent, they use imminent threat. Um, uh, Victor Cha testified, and this was his quote, he said the pace of North Korea's development shows that it wants to be able not just to field one missile that could reach the United States, but a whole slew of them. And the panel all agreed on that. So we're getting into really talking about serious things here. You just now, in response to a question or a comment by the chairman, said that it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. So we know, and I think it's our job, and it's incumbent upon the military as well as us to let the American people know the nature of the threat that's out there. Now. Last year, Senator Rounds and I led a, a group uh, to uh, your area, and we talked about uh, the, some of the things that were taking place at that time. And uh, we came back and we had that hearing that you referred to. In the hearing, you were asked the question as to what, do, what are your needs there in terms of resourcing yourself adequately to meet the threats. Let's keep in mind that was a year ago, and with the threats is totally it been enhanced since that time, what would those needs be uh, today as opposed to what we thought they were a year ago? Sir, uh, last year uh, uh, I commented that I had the forces to fight tonight, to respond tonight uh, to any threat from North Korea uh, or anywhere else for that matter, and I still believe that today. I have the forces uh, in place to fight tonight if necessary. Uh, what I'm concerned about are those follow-on forces uh, and how those, and uh, the forces themselves, and also how those follow-on forces would get to the region in terms of airlift and sea lift. So I'm, I'm worried about that. I'm also worried about uh, 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 things like small diameter uh, bombs and other kinds of munitions, uh, anti-air warfare uh, weapons for our fighter aircraft, uh, adequate numbers of AIM-9D and AIM-120 uh, uh, missiles. Uh, I worry about the shortage of anti-ship missiles, uh, and whether it's uh, long-range anti-surface missiles, uh, more tomahawk, or whatever, but a, a, a long-range uh, any, any surface missile. Uh, I would like to see uh, a fifth SSN in Guam, but more than the fifth SSN in Guam, uh, our nation is facing uh, a significant uh, shortage uh, and in terms of uh, submarine numbers. Yeah, so, I, so, so as a combatant commander, for example, I only get 50% uh, of the submarines that I think I need, but that's based on a 52 submarine force. And by the end of the 2020s, the Navy projects a, that submarine force, attack submarine force, will go down to 42. So my requirements won't go down, but the, uh, the, the pool from which uh, they'll be sourced is going to drop dramatically. So I worry about that significantly uh, as I look at the threat from North Korea, potential threat from China, uh, and from Russia. Yeah, and we're going to be depending on you to advise us in, in not generalities, but as you're getting into right now, priorities right. on the, the needs that you have, and we will depend on that. I am also uh, encouraged that our allies are more uh, dependable than uh, what they have been in the past, and is it your impression that they see this as the threat that's out there uh, as we do, and that, does this open the door for maybe even more allies coming in our direction? Uh, I, I believe it does, and, and, and if, if we define allies, or, uh, you know, as partners like, like you're talking, you know, we only have five treaty, uh, defense treaty allies uh, in the world, and they're all in the Indo-Asia Pacific. We have other countries that are uh, that are close to us, uh, that are partners with us. Singapore comes to mind, uh, for example. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, mm -hmm. India, Vietnam. Uh, these are countries that I think 
uh, are uh, uh, seek the United States as a security partner of choice. Yeah, well, I appreciate that very much. Now, my time has expired, but I'd like to just ask one more question. You made the statement we should cease to be cautious about the language we use to describe these activities. Can you be, define that a little bit for us? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure in what context uh, you're referring Okay, to. that was a quote, and I'll do that for the record and give you the context, okay. I, because it's something that a lot of us didn't understand. Yes, sir. Thank you very you much. His goal is a nuclear warhead. These are my words, but I think it's what you meant. Married to an ICBM that would have the capability of getting to the U.S. And you said it's not our in your opinion, not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Is that a correct interpretation of what you've said? It, it is correct, sir. Okay. And you also uh, offered your opinion that you would not bet that China can basically de deter the DPRK. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, to be clear, uh, I felt uh, uh, in the past that China, uh, though has, the, though it had the or has the capability uh, to uh, uh, influence and affect North Korean behavior, uh, for a number of reasons, it had chosen not to exert the full range of its influence. Uh, and I think we're in a different place now. Uh, I think the jury's out. It's early days. Uh, we'll have to see uh, if China has changed its view of uh, its willingness uh, to uh, influence KGU. Based on their previous activity, there's no indication that you think that that's going to occur, although you're hopeful. Well, right, sir. I mean, past performance is no indicator of future productivity. So. Uh, up to up to uh, a month or two ago, I would agree with that statement completely. Um, after all, I made the statement. So, uh, but uh, from a month ago forward, I mean, we're seeing uh, some positive uh, behavior from from China, and I'm encouraged by that. So, I, I think we should let the uh, let this thing play out a little bit and see where it goes. Now, part of that, though, Kim Jong Un and, and the North Korean regime, uh, you know, they can't do something pre precipitative. Uh, in the intervening period uh, to, to uh, test us. So we have to be careful and sensitive to that as well. Precisely. So up to this point, has China done anything that would give you uh, an indication that they are going to be helpful to the U.S. in getting uh, the leader to back off of his intent to nuclearize uh, an ICBM? Sir, I, I, I don't know for a fact what China has done in the last uh, month or so. Uh, I know that they uh, are active in, in, uh, in uh, uh, working the problem set, but I don't know the specifics of what they've done. Uh, uh, all, all I see are the, are, the, uh, are the activities that Kim Jong Un has done uh, you know, in the last uh, month or so. And that is still on his march to nuclearize ICBM? Uh, I, I think it is, though in the last month he has not tested a, a nuclear weapon. Uh, so he's tested five this century, and, and uh, he hasn't tested a sixth. Uh, he has not launched an ICBM in the last month uh, or ever. So I don't know if, 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 if that is, if there's a cause and effect or whether it just didn't fit his schedule. Right. So, uh, I, I, again, uh, it's early days on this, so I, I think we would be best served uh, to see if this uh, has um, a positive outcome or not and let President Xi and, uh, uh, you know, work, work this issue uh, as he and the president said he agreed they would. Sure. Uh, but if China doesn't deter him, there's only one deterrence left. And that's the U.S. Uh, kinetic action. Is that what it looks like? Uh, I, I, I don't want to say that there's only that uh, option left. Uh, I, I think if China's efforts fails, then we're back to where we were 
uh, 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 status quo ante, if you will, to try to throw some Latin in there. Uh, and, and at that point, and then as the President has said, all options are on the table. And, and I think he means just that, all options are on the table. So my job in, in, in that framework uh, is to provide military options, but there are other options, I'm, I'm sure, and, and, uh, uh, and, and, I, and I would leave it to those experts to come up with those options. But my options are hard power options. And your hard power options, you need additional materiel. Uh, I, I, I need additional materiel uh, in the long run, but that's not to suggest that the hard power options that the U.S. military can provide the President would not be effective tonight, and they would be effective tonight if called upon to execute them. 